Good afternoon. As Ed said, my name is Marcia Smith, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Sustainability and External Affairs at Tech. And proudly Canadian, Tech is a global uh, leader in sustainable resource development, and we are Canada's largest diversified resource company with a focus on steelmaking coal, zinc, copper, and energy. And I just want to say for, for quickly, as I, as I arrive here in the nation's capital, um, what an amazing city this is, and I want to thank the Algonquin peoples for welcoming us to their traditional territories today. It is my great pleasure to introduce our guests this afternoon. We're very fortunate to have the Honourable Bill Morneau, Canada's Minister of Finance, and Amanda Lang of Bloomberg Television. We're looking forward to hearing their thoughts on the drivers of growth that will support our country's long-term economic future. And their thoughts on questions like, what are the growing economies of the world that will play a key role in our economic future? How can we be a leader in tackling climate change and seize the opportunity that climate change presents to us? How can we encourage innovation and the development of clean technology throughout our economy as the world transitions to a lower carbon future? And in my own industry's case, how can we promote competitive, sustainable resource development that can be a model for the world? And while Canada has certainly made progress on many of these matters, I know that we can go even further as we recognize that the economy and the environment are not in competition with one another. Rather, they go hand in hand and can help build a modern, innovative, and prosperous Canada. There is certainly no doubt that Minister Morneau and his government have already stack, started tackling these issues. And I certainly look forward, as I'm sure you do, to hearing more about their plans today. With that, I will once again welcome our guests and turn the program over to Amanda. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to um, ask the finance minister some questions for uh, 15 minutes or so, and then we'd like to invite you to ask the finance minister some questions. Uh, there are microphones in the room. Um, you'll see them they're right across the front here. And I will come to you at that microphone as soon as you're standing there. So, um, well, not all at the same time, but if you follow. We do want to hear from you, because I think um, the finance minister will agree that that's probably um, yeah, more, that's more fun anyway. Um, Lots of good ideas. When you have a summit that's about growth, growing the Canadian economy, uh, there's a sense of optimism, there's a sense of confidence and good energy, really good rhetoric. How do you pay for it? So you thought you'd start easy? Yeah. So, um, well, why don't I start by just saying it's a real pleasure to be here and thank all of you for coming. <laughs> Maybe that's a place to go. That's the first part of the answer. My preferred stalling yes. tactic is that's a good question. But okay, just, that's just so perfect. You know. Um, you know, you actually ask what I think is maybe the most important question that we were asked when we ran for office, which is, um, you know, what do you do about an economy that hasn't been growing at the pace that we would like it to, that's facing significant long-term challenges, demographic challenges? Um, how do you actually try and get a handle on that in a way that engages and keeps Canadians along with you. So uh, our message has been pretty clear. We think that uh, with, with the balance sheet that Canada has, with the lowest net debt to GDP of G7 countries, uh, with an environment of low interest rates uh, that uh, looks like it's um, going to continue, we uh, believe that making significant investments is the right thing to do. And uh, we'd like to think that what Canadians will judge us on is the quality of those investments over the long term, how we amplify those investments to have the biggest impact on the economy, and how uh, those investments and the other measures we're going to take are going to make a difference for Canadian families, for the people who uh, need to be engaged in those discussions to, uh, to allow our country to continue to be successful. So that, that's not uh, rhetoric. That, that we think is the right way for us to go about dealing with the economic situation that we're in today. A budget is a blueprint uh, of a strategy. It's not, it's not just numbers. It's ideas, mm. it's vision, it's big picture. But you are also in charge of a budget that, for better or worse, a lot of people want you to get to balance. Mm. And uh, promises have been made. 
how do we feel about where fiscal restraint matches up with the need to stimulate and, and foster growth? Well, maybe the best way to address that is to, again, come back to the frame. So we, that was a good question too, by the Thank way. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, the, uh, the frame we came into office again was about making investments. And we, 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 we went, you know, I'll, I'll step back to last uh, December when we were recently into office, I went to Antalya for the first G20 meeting that I was at. And uh, the rest of the uh, participants there heard what we were talking about, which was inclusive growth helping middle class Canadians and making investments to grow the economy. And they all uh, listened. They heard the idea that we were going to make fiscal investments. Uh, there was, a, I would say, a sense in the room that this was an interesting idea, that we were taking the right measures against you know, monetary policy that maybe had run out of steam. Um, but not everyone was on the same page with respect to the inclusive part of inclusive growth. So fast forward almost 12 months. And it's a completely different environment. So the combination of Brexit and the anti-protectionist, uh, anti-trade, anti, uh, or pro -pro or protectionist, anti-trade, uh, anti-immigrant uh, discussion that's going on south of the border has led people to understand that there is a real challenge with, with dealing with that Canadian anxiety. So, so all of a sudden, everyone's seeing that you know, the inclusive part of inclusive growth really matters. Mm -hmm. and engineering growth through using the tools we have really matters. So I'm not discounting the importance of fiscal responsibility. The quality of those investments matter. But we, we need to be thinking about how do we actually improve our growth rate? How do we actually deal with the challenges that we're faced with? And the alternative of austerity at a time when we're facing those low growth rates uh, would put us in a much more challenging position. So we're going to be fiscally responsible. We're going to maintain that uh, objective to have fiscal anchors. Um, and you know, as we put out our, our fiscal uh, update this fall, Canadians will get a better sense of, of where we stand and, and how we're going to make an impact. You're seeking input um, and commentary, Dominic Barton and, uh, and that entire group, with big ideas, bold ideas. Hmm. Will we see some of those bold ideas in the fiscal update? You will. So we, we sought out Dominic because uh, you know, he has a global perspective, one of the you know, leading global thinkers and, and uh, happily one of the, the uh, great uh, Canadian ambassadors. Uh, and the other people, some of whom I see, I see Ilsa sitting right here, that we've uh, engaged to be a member of our advisory council because we, we wanted to work together with them to think about the things that can, can make a positive long-term difference on our country. So, so we've charged them to think about um, you know, investments in infrastructure. We've charged them to think about uh, innovation policy. We've charged them to think about talent and labor. And we've charged them to think about you know, our trading relationships. And we've encouraged them to be uh, seeking out the best ideas from around the world, uh, to bringing forth uh, you know, challenging ideas that will push us to make decisions that are going to be in the best long term interests of Canadians. And explicitly, we've said, your job is not to be constrained with the politics. We need to think about what are the things that we can do, how can we do them, and then think about the politics afterwards. Our job is to think about how we can actually get Canadians to engage in those things that will make a difference. Don, uh, Michael Sabia is also on, um, on that panel. Uh, he used the words infrastructure bank earlier today, uh, which seems significant. Thanks, Michael. Is he here still? He had to go to Montreal, yeah, okay. yeah. He's gone. Lucky for him. Yeah. Um, are you close enough to some kind of formalized structure that an infrastructure bank could be announced? Well, first of all, Michael Sabia and Mark Wiseman, two people that are on our, our committee who are very uh, engaged in the infrastructure discussion, uh, bring an enormous amount of expertise to the table, an understanding of global markets that uh, is very helpful. Another stalling tactic. That's right, yeah. So good question again. Um, no, but I mean, they've told us a few things. They've told us that, um, they've told us that we, we need to have projects that are big enough for institutional investors. They've told us that we need to have a pipeline of projects so they can see some long-term horizon. They've told us that they need to have counterparties in government that they can talk to about projects. Um, and you know, all those things we've, we've listened to. They've also told us we need to deal with political risk. So when you think about those things, the idea of having some sort of central agency that can help us deal with those things for institutional investors makes eminent sense. 
so we are working on the idea of uh, developing a, uh, an infrastructure approach for us that will allow us to work with institutional investors, allow them to put much more money on the table for our trans transformational investments, and uh, we'll have more to say about that in the very near term. Infrastructure is important. Um, it's, it's quick juice. It's, uh, we have a massive deficit in infrastructure, mm -hmm. so that's, it is not sexy. Not conceptually, not in practice. Uh, most of the stuff that we need to replace or upgrade, not that interesting. Do you have sexy stuff coming? Well, we think it's sexy. Well, you can think it's, it's sexy. Like wastewater but... systems, for example. Right? Doesn't that sound great? Um, you know, uh, we are explicitly not going after public policy based on sex appeal. I'll just say that here. <laughs> um, Touche. Yeah. Our, I mean, our goal is... But I mean, is, big vision, stuff that what Canadians it, will think, go, wow, our government is amazing, and this is what they're, like healthcare, like a transcontinental highway, like, you know, stuff that really gets people jazzed. Well, what I get jazzed, I mean, this might say is some statement about me, but I do get jazzed about the stuff that's going to have the biggest impact on the economy. So, so what are the things that are going to have the biggest impact on the economy? We think that the things that we started out with that are making Canadians understand that there's an agenda for helping them actually can have a big long-term impact on the economy both in terms of their spending habits but also in their confidence so tax cuts for the middle class the Canada child benefit which is bringing a significant amount of money to families raising kids you know especially families who need it start to engage people to be more confident in their future those they may not be sexy but I think they have a real impact and then infrastructure, if we crowd in institutional investors, can have a big impact. If we're successful at encouraging more foreign direct investment, that can have a big impact. If we're able to be uh, successful in continuing to engage internationally on trade policy, that can have a big impact. I don't think we think there's any one silver bullet. We need to do a lot of things well, uh, including you know, our own talent here. We need to attract talent. We need to engage. We need to get people uh, participating in the labor force. The combination of all these things uh, leads to us to, you know, to each one can have, you know, a half a point uh, impact on growth. That would be really significant. Donald Trump. I've heard about him. Mm -hmm. yes. Hopefully not in a locker room. Yeah. Uh, wow. <laughs> He's never been in a locker room I've been in. Good. Um, nor anyone like him. <laughs> we, uh, you know, I will tell you that. Um, as we have gone to these international meetings over the course of this year, you can really see the, uh, all of our, you know, if I think about the finance ministry meetings, all of my international colleagues concerned with how uh, families, you know, we call it middle class Canadians in the United States, they talk about working families, concerned with how people are feeling, concerned with uh, technology change and globalization, its impact on families. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether it's Trump or Sanders or the Brexit uh, decision, these are, these are real signals that there's a challenge. Uh, we had a, one global CEO at our uh, IMF meetings this past weekend in Washington talk about a raging fire inside the, the middle class of the United States. These are real issues that we need to be concerned with. And that's really, I think, when you think about the rest of the world is coming to our inclusive growth message. It's really, I'm seeing it around the world. And it is about that sense that we need to show people the benefits of trade. We need to show people the benefits of uh, technology change. We need to see the benefits for, for Canadians or they won't be engaged in, in what we know will grow our economy. So uh, Trump is the canary in the coal mine. I'm going to open it up to um, questions in the room. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, the microphones are just behind the first row of tables. There are four of them. You took steps recently um, to, I said cool earlier, and you corrected me, so I won't do it again, but stabilize the housing market. Right. Um, and that has some people concerned. They're concerned for first-time buyers. They're concerned if they're bankers. Uh, there's, there's a concern that, this, that it was too much. Mm. Well, I think uh, one of the things that we want to be very... Uh, careful to ensure that we continue to do is to watch out for the risks to our economy. We know we need to think about the long-term growth of the economy. We know we need to think about how Canadians deal with uh, the transitional challenges of technology change. 
But none of that works if we have an economy that's, uh, that's risky because of uh, how we either manage a part of the, the market, the housing market in this instance, or how people individually and collectively take decisions. So in our estimation, we need to stay focused on the risk uh, to Canadian families in housing. We need to think about the risk to Canadians and to the government around the, how the, uh, the market uh, potential long tail risk is shared. And uh, we're doing that. And we're doing it in a way that we think is, is careful. Uh, any changes we make around uh, risk sharing will be gradual. Uh, and it, I think, will help Canadians to feel confident about the status of their investment and make prudent decisions for their family in terms of how they should invest in this very low interest rate environment. Uh, I'm going to start at microphone three. Good afternoon, Minister Morneau. This is Kelly Hutchinson from ITAC. My question is more around government's own modernization and transformation as really a necessity to moving Canada's digital needle forward. Uh, the ICT sector sees digital government as a very sexy initiative, and so my question to you is, are there plans for the government of Canada to be investing in its own modernization and transformation so we can fuel citizen-centric and business-centric service delivery? Well, uh, we, uh, in our last budget, put in a number of measures around uh, digitization of government services. So we've uh, already made a statement to Canadians, this is important. We recognize that there's a number of ways that the government interacts with citizens, and we're convinced that we should be able to move those on to more advanced technological platforms. Uh, as you have seen in some of the things that we've been doing, it's, it's not always you know, two steps forward without some, some challenges. We recognize that. Uh, but anyone who's been involved in large IT change projects knows that uh, you need to be staying at it for the long run. Uh, we're doing so. Um, the, the government uh, before us had started to make these sorts of transitions. We're very focused on continuing and enhancing our capacity to be digital as a government. So it'll be something that'll be a continuing theme and uh, you'll see that from us. But are you also newly committed to um, sourcing Canadian. In other words, pr government procurement is a huge source of support for small business. Is there a new focus on that? Well, I think there's uh, really two ways we can address that. One is in our own sourcing, and we are looking at how <coughs> our procurement practices can uh, emphasize uh, within trade rules, can emphasize the opportunity to to use Canadian firms, uh, Canadian uh, small and medium-sized enterprises to give them an opportunity. Uh, we also see as one of our responsibilities to talk to those organizations that uh, sell to government or organizations that we're engaged with on a regular basis to encourage them to be uh, proactive in, in uh, procuring Canadian and, and trying to help uh, Canadian organizations. So on both those two fronts, we'll make initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Question? Uh, hey, Lasha Babia from Johnson & Johnson. A pleasure to, uh, to hear you talk today. Um, we heard a lot this morning about the need for a whole of society um, uh, approach, a whole of Canada approach, if you will, for the innovation agenda and to you know, drive uh, more uh, robust growth. We also heard about the need for collaboration with uh, uh, different levels of government. So curious, again, on the, perhaps on the procurement side, but uh, also the adoption side, given that a lot of that happens, um, especially in the life sciences sector, at the provincial level, how challenging will it be to, uh, to um, uh, achieve a greater level of collaboration with the provinces as to uh, a more robust uh, adoption uh, procurement strategy? Well. Um you know, you've heard us, uh, since we've come into government, uh, talk about the importance of collaborating with provinces. Uh, that said, we have to recognize that there's places where we're going to be able to collaborate and places where we each have our own individual spheres of, of influence. So uh, us uh, being able to you know, tell provinces what to do in terms of procurement practices would you know, probably not be a very successful uh, approach. But I think uh, showing what we can do will be a good example. Uh, we clearly showed through the Canada Pension Plan enhancement discussions that we can collaborate when we have mutual interests and a mutual understanding of, of what can uh, enhance you know, our, our collective opportunities. So we will engage and uh, we'll also be respectful of the places where it's not our responsibility. Question here. Thank you. <laughs> Canadian Home Builders Association. So, of course, I have questions around mortgage rules, but I'll, I'll stick to just one or two. But I also want to say. Just one. 
Right, one. Yeah. I, I do want to say, though, in terms of sexiness, yeah, I think infrastructure today for moving Canadians around and helping them get, get from A to B, um, transportation, transit, is a big opportunity and I think has changed in the minds of Canadians is something that is super important. With respect to the mortgage rules, of course, we have some serious concerns and I, I know you've been studying the markets and trying to figure out what to do about certain he heated markets, but I'm interested in the thoughts that went into of course, the, some of the markets that are very stable or in fact not doing so well in housing right now, like let's say Atlantic Canada um, and the big macro prudential move that affects all of Canadians. So how do you see that playing out? And since we're talking about growth, I expect you're looking at, well, this is a short term piece, but it's part of a bigger growth strategy. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on that. Well, we, uh, we did look at the different parts of the housing market and, and understood that Canada really is not one uniform market, but really three different markets with a quarter of the market, uh, Vancouver and Toronto and surrounding areas uh, experiencing, you know, unusually high growth and, you know, another um, significant part of the market uh, in places like Calgary and Edmonton and parts of Saskatchewan and Newfoundland that are experiencing real declines as well as a much more stable part of the market. So we, we recognized all those differences and that was something that we had to consider as we looked at, at measures. What we are aiming to do, and I'll come back to what I said earlier, is long-term stability for the market. Uh, in an environment where the, um, the overall indebtedness of Canadians across the country is a significant uh, challenge, and uh, the continuing low interest rates uh, create the opportunity for behaviors that may not be in the best interests of uh, Canadians as they make, as they make investments. So we, we looked at those factors when we came to what we thought were the right thing to do for the market overall. And the measures we took, first of all, the measure to deal with um, you know, people inappropriately using the uh, capital gains exemption on primary residences, it dealt with a, an issue that we needed to clean up. The issues around stress testing of mortgages we think will contribute to uh, better long-term decisions in, uh, as Canadians take decisions on, on, uh, on their mortgage. Um, you know, there, it will uh, potentially have some people delay their investment to get a bigger down payment or, you know, buy a, maybe a, a home that's slightly more geared to their, their income. Um, and then the, the other risk-sharing measures uh, we think are uh, appropriate for us to consider in consultation with the, the financial institutions in the market. So we did consider the different parts of the market. We recognized that there will be impacts. And in any time you take uh, decisions that uh, are meant to deal with long-term risks, there will be impacts. Uh, we think those impacts will be uh, relatively uh, short-term in, na in nature. Uh, we think they'll be uh, relatively modest and will contribute to a longer positive uh, growth pattern for the country. Question over here. Hi, Minister Morneau. My name is Michel Langelier. I'm with the University of Quebec in Montreal, and I do research work in the commercialization of innovation. And when you do a benchmarking uh, across the globe, uh, there's an outlier in terms of providing funding to SMEs, and it's Israel. And when you dig a little bit more, you find out that uh, it's because it's the diaspora, it's the people who are helping. So I was wondering, did you uh, envision, envision the possibility of creating perhaps a national innovation fund where uh, instead of purchasing government bonds, Canadian public could actually purchase long-term bonds and use this money actually to uh, invest in long-term project in SMEs because I'll be honest with you, when you analyze uh, how many SMEs that uh, do not get funded uh, because they have to go through a competitive process with VCs, perhaps 60% per percent of them are great project, but they will never really get funding. So I was curious to see if your mm. committee has investigated how we could create uh, probably this uh, uh, image de marque for the nation. Well, I mean, I think it's an interesting question and, and an idea that um, is maybe one that we should consider. The approach we've taken on this is we've, we've been working together with our advisory council where we've brought in some, uh, some people who have a, a very good understanding of uh, you know, how we can be more innovative as a country. We've uh, been thinking about uh, you know, how we ensure that we uh, get, attract the right talent to our country. 
uh, how we make the right investments at the, at the very front end in, uh, in R&D in universities. And I know we're, uh, we're going to be spending more time thinking about uh, how we best uh, commercialize uh, ideas as well as uh, how we ensure that there's the appropriate funding for organizations not only in the, uh, the venture capital stage but also in the next stage of, uh, of their growth. So these are all things that we're, uh, we're looking at to work through as we uh, bring forward the next stage in our innovation agenda. And you know, I know we'll have more to say, and, and it will certainly be between now and our, our 2017 budget. I do think, though, that uh, Israel presents some, uh, a very uh, interesting case example for a successful country, and it's, it's one that we have uh, been considering. And, and uh, finally, I think that the pension plans in Canada would be certainly interested to invest not only in infrastructure projects, but probably uh, in those type of projects, uh, recognizing that uh, there would be some guarantee of return, let's say on a 10-year scale. I'm going to come out uh, over here. Thank you, Minister Moreau, for uh, being with us today, first of all, and I'd like to ask you um, a question. Uh, you said that you know you wanted to provide alternatives uh, to austerity in our time of growth and as well that you wanted to show people the benefits of trade or that they wouldn't be engaged. Uh, could you elaborate further on what the government can do in aspects to that? Well, I guess what I was trying to um, identify is uh, not only a current concern but a future concern around anxiety of middle class Canadians or, or people who don't feel that the advantages from trade, from uh, technology, uh, more broadly from globalization are actually uh, positively impacting them. We need to be thinking forward on this because as we look forward to you know, maybe having a future where truck drivers don't exist because of technology change or receptionists don't exist because of technology change, we'll continue to have people who are challenged to see how these advantages for our overall economy are actually an advantage for their family. So our agenda was to start by thinking uh, seriously about how we can improve the lot of Canadian families. So as you saw us deal with uh, that at the very first instance by lowering taxes on middle class Canadians and yes, raising them on, on the top 1%, it was about showing people an advantage from, uh, from the economy that's going to their family. When we looked at the Canada Child Benefit, we said, you know, there's really no need for a universal benefit that goes to my family. Uh, I still have two of my four kids who are under 18 and I didn't need that benefit. We would be better off to take that benefit and means test it in such a way that lower income and middle income Canadians have a greater advantage so they can see that they have an advantage at uh, when they're not earning that much and when they're at the most challenging financial time in their life when they're raising kids. Uh, similar idea around Canada Pension Plan, getting rid of a long-term anxiety held by Canadians that you know, they may not be saving enough or the vehicles that, that don't exist anymore in their organization present them with a challenge. So those were the kind of measures that are about the inclusive part of inclusive growth. Our view is that if you don't show the benefits to people, that you can't expect them to be engaged in the positive outcome that we get from trade. You can't expect them to say, okay, we're going to suspend disbelief on long-term investments for our grandkids if it's not impacting our family today. So, so that's the measure of inclusive growth that we're trying to bring forward. And we, we think that that's the way that we can you know, engage Canadians in doing what's best for all of us, which is to make those investments and show them the benefits, not only in the long term, but in the short term. We've got Thank time for much. just one more question with apologies to people at the mics, but you've been waiting a long time, sir. Sorry. Thank you very much. Robert South with Polytechnics Canada. Uh, Minister Monod, very interested in what you were saying about the opportunities to invest in infrastructure. Obviously, one of the benefits of investing in infrastructure is it does create many good middle class jobs for the people that build and maintain it. I was wondering what thought you and your colleagues had put into ensuring that Canada has the necessary levels of skilled trades and other talented jobs needed to build and maintain this infrastructure, particularly given our aging workforce in the skilled trades, and whether you have any comments on any sort of thinking around a skills strategy that might be needed to help make sure that Canada has the people in place for this and other opportunities. Well, I think it's a good question. Uh, our, um, 
our infrastructure agenda is, is yes, about long-term productivity. Uh, in the shorter term, yes, we think that it can provide good, uh, you know, well-paying jobs, which will help middle-class Canadians. We also think that some of the infrastructure, infrastructure and things like housing, can actually show near-term benefits to people who are struggling, say, with affordable housing in our country. So, so it can have some of those benefits that I was just talking about to the, uh, the gentleman who was asking about how you help people along the way. Uh, in terms of uh, labor market challenges, uh, I guess we're trying to do a number of things that, uh, that we think will make a difference. We've been engaged in trying to help students. So we've uh, actually consciously gone out and changed the student grant system so that students are more likely to be able to stay in school without the significant debt that they have at the end of uh, you know, their time. Largely ensuring that people that may not have the means to be in school can stay in school. Uh, we will be looking through our, again, through our growth council at, at how we can deal with labor market strategy, uh, skills, funding. So that's one of the things that we, we are thinking about. Um, I don't think that our view is that we can uh, specifically say you need to be in this program or this program or this program, but we need to create the environment that encourages students to stay in study, that enables people to see the job opportunities that are there, and that provides sort of funding opportunities for people to get back into the uh, skills training or retraining as they go from one job to another. We see it as critically important. Uh, and you know we see the, the sector you're in, colleges and polytechnics, as being a key enabler for that success. Thank you. We are at time, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I ask you to thank me, uh, join me in thanking the minister for his time. Thanks. Thanks. It's great to be here. And I'm going to um, turn it over to Kevin Lynch. Mr. Lynch? Or Ed. Or Ed Greenspan? Or John Manley? I mean, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Bill. 